Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this live event. And thank you also for the many others that will be watching the recording of this event. Um, I have the pleasure to have with me Les Ball. I will ask him to introduce uh, uh, to introduce himself in a short while, but before we go to you know, the people that are here on the screen, we are very much interested in the people that are attending this event and uh, will be with us. So there are a couple of information that uh, will be interesting from us. One is from where you're joining, and the second is your seniority level, right? You know, we're just interested to understand if a topic like influencing at sea level is uh, attracting more uh, director, vice president or whatever, or if it's more like people at the beginning of their career that they want to learn how to deal with uh, the top executives. What are the kind of strategies that work uh, with them? So. But for both the case, of course, you know, you're very welcome to join us. But if you could tell us some more about where you're joining us and what is your seniority level inside the organization, or maybe, you know, you're just, you know, you, maybe you are an entrepreneur, maybe you are uh, uh, working in, uh, in government or whatever, but you're interested, you know, to discover some more about those techniques. So it will help us to learn a bit more. Uh, about uh, our audience. I know that there is always uh, a small delay between the moment that people write down their comments on StreamYard and the moment that the information is visible. So we'll just uh, be patient to wait your comments. In the meantime, how about getting to discover some more about uh, uh, our expert today, Les Ball? So, Les. Hi, good good day, everybody. And uh, first of all, thank you, Giuseppe, for giving me the opportunity to participate with you in this live event. Um, in, influencing at a sea level, and I would say building relationships and partnerships with senior executives has really been, I think, fundamental in the success that I've had uh, during my career. And um, that career started with Ford Motor Company. Uh, way way back and um, and since that time uh, and, and virtually all of the time has been in procurement and supply chain um, I've moved through Siva Logistics, Eaton Corporation, ABB and, uh, and most recently with Otis and um, and I've taken a step back from the corporate world uh, and um, I'm now actually um, coaching, mentoring, and providing uh, consulting support to individuals and organizations that are interested. I'm based in Switzerland. I um, am married with two kids. And um, yeah, I'm very happy to be here today. Fantastic. So let's, uh, what we like is that you bring a lot of real life experience and uh, pretty much in the field of procurement and supply chain. And uh, that's also a field looking at some of the people in the audience. You know, we do see a number of people that uh, are working in the sector. So that's fantastic. So Les, you got to sea level. I mean, uh, help us understand how important have you found being able to influence sea level executives during your career and how much has contributed to your achievements? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I've been in senior levels for the last 25 years, and I've been fortunate to, to have, have got there and have worked with some fantastic uh, executives at a senior level who really were open to partnering with procurement and supply chain to, uh, to be able to move their businesses forward. And I think this is a critical, a critical takeaway that, that without executive support, it's very, very difficult to not just to get things done that are the basic things that you're responsible for, but particularly if you want to have a transformation or a step change in the performance of the organization. And uh, so for me, it's been mission critical, instrumental in success. And and I, I use the term personal brand. It, it, it actually adds to your personal brand where you are able to influence the C-level and build that partnership 
to be able to get the support and air cover to to get things done mm -hmm. so what you're saying is you know if you try to go on your own there is a certain level of change that you can make in the organization if you want to make something much more substantial then you need to be able to get uh, the sea level with you right this is going to be fundamental exactly it unlocks the essential uh, support and sponsorship which actually opens doors and keeps doors open but it also enables you to get funding and to to build that inertia uh, once you get started to to you know for what could be a multi-year journey um, so it's almost like a contract or a, a charter between you and the executive in terms of uh, the, the vision that you have for your function. Okay, perfect. Now, let's get concrete. I mean, what would you suggest are maybe the top three elements in influencing such senior levels in an organization, let's say maybe for procurement, since you procurement, you worked a lot in procurement, you know, number, a lot of the audience is in procurement. I mean, so what are maybe three key elements and why they're so crucial in your opinion? Yeah, I, I, I believe in the power of three. So thank you for asking for three examples. So, or, or three steps. So, um, um, in my, in my career and particularly in the latter part of my career, it's been really focused on on uh, building change and transformation and really maximizing the value that organizations can get out of their procurement uh, or organizations and resources. So for me, it always starts with envisioning and developing a strategy and a game plan that you, that you would want to deploy in the organization to be able to re realize that objective. And, and so, for me, the takeaway has been build that plan that resonates with the leadership, that in fact is even expressed in the metrics that the leadership is measured against. Even maybe incorporating some of the strategic objectives that the senior leadership is looking for, which, which could, you know, there's many things that that could be, but it could be business continuity as an example, beyond just the normal uh, you know, savings that procurement is often target, targeted to deliver. So the first step is the you know, envisioning the game plan. And of course, then the, the next step is selling that to the senior leadership and getting their sponsorship and their excitement behind that plan and helping to really build the support and the consensus with your peers and your uh, colleagues in adjacent functions, I think, is a is a critical step. So as you build your plan, you 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 obviously observe, you take information, uh, you uh, you you speak with your peers, with your team, and, and with the leadership themselves. And so you you actually sell the plan, not just from a procurement point of view, but from a complete organizational point of view. And then, of course, the third step is to execute seamlessly, and that that often is uh, the most difficult piece. But with no surprises, regular and, and with regular updates for the leadership. But 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 doing that maybe with um, in, um, utilizing lean six sigma or utilizing standard work, um, and so you can actually build um, standard ways of doing things to really get scalability across across your your function yeah now uh, i mean you gave us three steps right you know so envisioning a strategy you know selling it to senior management and then execute it now how about giving us some specific examples because you know our audience like to hear uh, stories and uh, i'm sure you have planned in your career <laughs> which one of those three steps if you could give us some context the challenges uh, how you move things forward, the outcomes, you know, that will help uh, people understand. Yeah. So, I mean, I think one, one example which, which has really, um, has, has really um, gone down very well in, in, in most of the organizations that I've been in is to, is to build a, um, a stand, standard process of connecting with your senior stakeholders. So these aren't necessarily the people that you work directly for, 
but the adjacent stakeholders that are on the end of the services that procurement provides. And, and by doing that, listening to their needs, uh, adjusting your plan and your actions to address some of the things that they would like to be done, uh, builds a uh, partnership with your adjacent functions. So for example, in, in Otis, uh, we, we did this building um, relationships with the, with the regional leaders, with the operational leaders, and incorporating their needs into the strategy of procurement. Of course, then when you go and sell that to the leadership, it's, it's already got that organizational uh, support and commitment built in. And then as you make progress, not only are you telling the leadership of the progress that you're making, but ideally your, your stakeholders and other functions are also telling the leadership of the progress. And then it, and then it starts to really uh, pay dividends because the, the organization overall sees progress delivering on your on your commitments and of course that unlocks the influence of the sea level um and another example which you yeah, know I mean, just you know first you know let's let's try to capture yeah. you know the first learning that you're saying here you know your strategy should not be just you know your functional strategy you should not just think about you know what you want to achieve as your functional objectives you pay attention to what is important for the other people. You incorporate it into a strategy so that uh, when your strategy comes, it's going to get uh, uh, more support. You're going to build you know, your coalition, the people that uh, are going to support you in getting approval because you know, their needs are also met by your strategy document, right? Yeah, exa exactly. So again, I can, I can give an example way back in the, in the day, back in Eton, where one of our objectives as we were a very acquisitive company at the time was to really drive scalability, to be able to do more with less or to do more with the same resources. And so that was again, um, a senior leadership uh, strategic requirement that we factored into our procurement strategy and our game plan. And again, because it was something that resonated with the leadership, it got, really automatic support because they could see that it met their overarching goals for, for the organization beyond beyond procurement um and um and, and so i think that the, the takeaway for me has always been um don't don't just include your procurement metrics as part of your targeting uh, and, and, and goals but look at the value drivers for other fu functions and they're, and they're everywhere from from product development to operations you know to finance through to you know, other other functions um factor some of those into your game plan because that will build you um influence and it will also win you collaborators perfect now if we move to the second point did you mention you know selling it to the senior leaders. I mean, uh, uh, what are some of the things that uh, help you to successfully sell it? You know, what is uh, the advice you have for us? Yeah, the, um, the, the, the current uh, chairman and CEO of Eaton, Craig Arnold, um, way, way back in the day in Eaton when he was running one of the businesses, he, he shared a, a, um, an approach which he called think like an owner. And wherever you are in the organization, you know, think, think like an owner. In, in ABB, we, we had a term that was similar, one level up thinking. Um, you know, think like the next level up when you come to putting together your plan and, and making your decisions. I think those two things are, are essential as a procurement leader. Again, not to forget your procurement metrics, but to think like an owner of the business or to think like the CEO of the business and use that to influence your game plan and your strategic projects. Um, again, not to forget your metrics for procurement, but to enhance them with other, other key deliverables. Um, I mean, one example, um, which, which may be interesting, it was a, 
it, it was a small thing, relatively speaking, but for the business, it was a major deliverable to help re release capital from um, re redundant material or material that was no longer uh, useful in terms of being able to be sold for the business and the equipment that was used to make that that, that product it was it was um, it was uh, superseded um, and um, you know procurement helped to 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 sell that uh, that uh, material and the equipment that it that was used to produce it and brought in a huge cash flow impact for the for the for the business I mean, very very positive in free cash flow and that happened to be a key metric of the overall organization so so again not you know thinking out of the box to find sources of, of value that will help you to unlock the support and the sponsorship at a senior level yeah thank you but there, there, there one, i mean just 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 to add we, we also got to the stage of expressing our metrics um in the in the way that uh, would resonate with the leadership so instead of just using savings as a, as a or or dpo uh, in terms of uh, in terms of cash flow we started to express our metrics and showed a a connection with things like ebit and with return on capital employed and with free cash flow and so when we started to develop scorecards we didn't just have um, a procurement scorecard that was in isolation that didn't mean much to anybody else, but it actually related to the overarching uh, organizational objectives. So it was very clear the value that was being driven by procurement. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. And, and then, you know, the execution. What, uh, do you have a story for us uh, of uh, uh, seamless execution? Yeah, I think um, in in all the organisations that I've worked in recently, um, there's been often, um, maybe every time, many different ways that things were done. And often that's because different factories, different regions or different business units were, were working independently somewhat and had never gone through really an integration or a standard way of working. Um, and so, you know, what, what we found, and I, I'm blessed to have worked for Eaton at the stage of, uh, of when Eaton um, entered into uh, the, the, the Lean Six Sigma journey and the Eaton business system, we became very um, focused on um, ways of working and standard ways of working and really going from a very tactical approach to procurement to a more strategic approach that was supported with standard processes and tools. And over time, you know, everybody uh, working the same way with the same process and the same tools you know, led, led to superior outcomes, which included uh, fantastic execution of, of projects whether they be savings, negotiation projects, or selling, you know, capital equipment, or, you know, dealing with trade management uh, challenges, but, you know, it worked across the board. And so I think one of, one of, the, one of the foundations is really the, the, the idea of standard work and, and, and moving to a much more strategic way of working. Yeah, perfect. By the way, a uh, small point, um, we want to make you aware about a couple of things that are coming up. So, uh, and then you know, but it, the first thing that as as I as I talk about this, I want to remind you that this is your LinkedIn life. So, if you do have some specific question that you want to ask, specifically on the topic of influencing at sea level, you know, I know that there are a few questions that are a bit, you know, building on the overall uh, less experience, but a bit far away from the topic. Now, if you do have some question about influencing that you want to ask, you know, do not hesitate to use the chat, and then we will address them. Now, I want to tell you that uh, those are the last few days to register for our strategic negotiation masterclass. 
is taking place on the 27th and 28th of June in Geneva. Oxford Professor Owen Derbyshire and I will be spending a couple of days with you, plus uh, a two years journey after uh, the masterclass to continue the learning journey. So uh, the signing up ends on the 16th of June. So, you know, if you wanna sharpen your negotiation skills, that's the chance. Now, uh, the second point I want to tell you on the 16th of June, so one week from now, then uh, I'm also running a webinar and uh, negotiating with no alternatives. I know that this is a typical challenge for procurement people. So if you do have uh, an interest in uh, learning a few more ideas on how to negotiate with no alternatives, then uh, we will, I will be giving you 15 strategies that can help you to deal more effectively with those kind of challenges. So you find the link to both elements in, uh, in, uh, in the chat. Um, by the way, in the meantime, you know, we do have uh, a comment about you, Les. It's great to listen, Les, after a long time. This is a great leader and influencer. It was an amazing experience of learning, working, and, and for less. Okay. We don't know the name of the person, but there is somebody that uh, is playing uh, compliment that's even better without name because we know that it's sincere that uh, somebody's not doing it just you know because of two, my mom my mom died 10 years ago so it can't be my mom so <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can, I, can i can i just add i mean i i do see a few ex-colleagues and friends on the on the call which is nice um i think i think as a procurement leader you have a choice you can you can just go for the day-to-day metrics of, of procurement and you know work your way through like the standard stuff that we all you know know and love yeah or you can take a, a different approach and say from today i'm going to be a transformational leader and i'm going to go beyond just the basic metrics of procurement and i'm going to aim to influence my executives by starting to build a strategy that will be a positive differentiator for my for my business and it may require some funding and it may require some effort but it's going to be a lot more interesting and exciting than just plodding along trying to make the savings trying to satisfy uh, the organization you know where you've got an ever decreasing opportunity to 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 improve costs uh, through through tr traditional ways so I would, I would encourage everybody, uh, whatever level you are, because this can be applied whether you're a, a junior category manager or a senior CPO or a VP, um, to, to, to think about that. What, what could you do transformationally for your business to, to change the, the dynamics and to change the status quo? Um, as you become more mature, Another another example which we did with a good, with really good um, um, experience in, in the US when I was in ABB, we created supplier advisory councils and we asked some of our executives to be champions for our biggest suppliers. And we brought the executives to regular meetings with the suppliers and they became champions of those huge suppliers that, you know, tending to be the most strategic ones. And that was transformational because it opened the eyes of the executives into the world more closely of procurement. And they felt like they were not just in charge of procurement, but they felt that they had a stakeholding for the success of procurement. And so, again, those of you that have got big spends, think about how you could leverage your executives to be a sponsor or a champion for some of your biggest suppliers because it it can really work very favorably in, in building not just the relationship with the suppliers, but the, the success of procurement. Okay, that, that, that's a good one. And maybe, you know, uh, I will ask you some more details, right? You know, because uh, by the way, the terms may be different, you know, from one company to the other, but uh, what you experience with the supplier advisory council is uh, one of the senior executive was assigned to a specific strategic supplier and uh, 
he or she will be joining the annual meetings. He or she will have a counterpart at senior level also with the supplier. And uh, there was anything else that worked for you that uh, helped you know, to create this connection between the business and procurement? Yeah, let, let, let me explain. And I, I have to give credit to Dan Carroll, who I used to work with in, in Eaton, who was the first person I ever saw um, launch supplier advisory councils. Um, and uh, so I, I'm kind of mixed two things there. So, so we created an advisory council where we picked our top uh, 12 suppliers in each of two businesses. And we brought those suppliers together and we asked them, what could we do differently to get more value out of you as an organization? And we had an all day event. Uh, we presented uh, um, at the time it was a, uh, in ABB. We presented our strategy, our plans, our objectives, and then the suppliers each presented. And the executives of the business were actually in that, in that meeting. And then as a result of that meeting, we, we divided up the, the suppliers to have one of the executives be the, the champion of, of a handful of suppliers. So it was kind of mix, mixing it a little bit. So we had a, a, an executive champion for the major suppliers but then we were bringing those supplies together on a, on a you know on a frequent basis a couple of times a year to 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 ask them what could we do to get more value from you and of course that again brought the the senior leaders into the domain of procurement and it actually helped to to build influence and partnership in terms of get, getting things done um, so yeah. It works, and it works very well if you if you if you do it properly. It works very well. Interesting idea, very concrete one. So you know, think about how in your own business you can create this link between suppliers and business, and having procurement. You know, acting as the liaison between the different groups. Excellent. This our time is flying. You know, we are already towards the end of our event. Maybe let me ask you a question. You know. When we go back to influencing, you know, and uh, we often hear about the terms of office politics as a key success enabler. I mean, uh, what do you give to our audience? I mean, office politics is something that's been around, you know, for, forever, um, and um, and, it, and it, it's never going to go away. It might have changed a little bit with remote working, but it's it's still there. I I would say rise above it. You know, I go back to the to what I started to say about your personal brand. I would I would be um, I would aim to be seen as somebody that rises above the politics, that, that aims to build some sort of consensus where there is not agreement, uh, and consensus can just be people accepting something without necessarily agreeing, and to try and keep people you know, working with you rather than working against you. Um, I am sure sometimes politics is such that um, that, that becomes difficult to achieve. But I, what I would say is that you will always find some common ground if you look for it. And if you can find a way to, to do something for somebody that is politically against you, ultimately you will turn them around. And I'll give you an example. It was, it was way down in my organization at the time. I won't tell you which business uh, it was, but um, the business was about to get a million pound fine uh, for a trade infringement uh, for the business where there was some, let's say, politics in terms of um, the, the organization uh, between the operations and the and the corporate staffs. I personally flew to Liverpool and had a meeting with the trade authorities and proved to them through my personal involvement that what they were um, suggesting, which was a dual use on a product, was in fact not the intention of the product and the, and the million pound fine got withdrawn. Never had any political issues again with that. So it's, it's a question of finding 
a way to get people on your side. And, and to do that, I think it's finding something that you can do together to, to help uh, the organization and to help that party. Yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe, you know, let me also finish with an advice on office politics uh, to maybe the more junior people that are joining us and maybe positioning themselves for career growth. And one of the models that I like using it, I was just doing it this morning for INSEAD, is the PI model. So what is this idea of a PI model is that your career, you know, the way you're going to manage, uh, you know, you're going to make progress into a company is going to be a combination of three core elements. PI stands for performance, image, and exposure. So, of course, you, know, you need the performance, you need the results, you know, whether a function you are, whether it's about uh, cost saving, whether it's about uh, EBIT, whether it's about market share or uh, innovation, whatever, you know, you need to have the results. But there are two other critical components that are going to be successful. One is the image, how you're seen inside the company. Uh, you know, <laughs> what kind of reputation you have. Uh, do you are you uh, somebody that is seen as leadership material or just an individual contributor? The third element is the exposure. The exposure is how visible is what you do to senior management. Do you have a mentor? Do you have sponsors? And uh, and then you know maybe you know if say thirty percent the performance, thirty percent this image, thirty percent this exposure, there is another ten percent of luck. Right, you know, maybe you are at the right moment at the right time, and then you ended up, you know, getting this promotion to director or to vice president that is going to boost your career. But uh, think it over if you are only managing uh, one element of the pie, do think about performance, image, and exposure is going to help you to. I think, Giuse I think, Giuseppe, I think Giuseppe, that, that point about image is it resonates exactly with uh, the personal brand. That I was talking about. It's what, what, one of my first moves when I was in Ford. Somebody wrote a senior guy wrote on my leaving card, um, "Be nice to people on your way up, so that they're nice to you on your way down." And uh, and that's always stayed with me my whole career, because you just don't ever know who you're going to come up uh, against or with in the future. And so it's it's great. I think to try and have a career where you, you've built alliances and positive partnerships as much as you can, because you just don't know. It's a small world out there. And, um, and, and that also, I think, plays into the, the politics of, of the office, that the, the, the more you can push against it, the, the better it is. I think the one point I should have said with this uh, example I gave, the business announced the withdrawal of the £1 million pound fine not me because i said to them you you announce it as though it's your achievement you can imagine the, the the value politically that that had and and it's a it's an example that, that you know there are other things that you can do not so dramatic as that one nice story to finish less thank you very much thank you for the audience uh, that uh, joined us today and uh, thank you, Les, for sharing your wisdom. And uh, all the very best to all the people that join us today, either virtually or re uh, live or recording. And uh, our next event is going to be on the 20 of uh, LinkedIn Live event is going to be on the 20 of uh, June at one o'clock. And uh, if instead you know you want to uh, get serious about uh, more learning around the negotiation then we do have a couple of events still available one is the master class on uh, strategic negotiation on the 27 and 28th of june or we have a linkedin live for a uh, webinar sorry on negotiating with no alternatives on the 16. Can, can i just say giuseppe that your your programs are fantastic so anybody out there listening uh, i can highly recommend them and uh, even after 40 years in procurement, I, I learn things from, from Giuseppe uh, regularly. So uh, thank you, Giuseppe. Thank you very much, Les. All the very best.
to you for being with us. Have a great weekend. Keep in Thank touch. You. Goodbye, everybody, and uh, look forward to hearing from you. Goodbye. Thank you.